Now that we've talked about causes and effects of spinal cord injury, we'll move on to medical tests, interventions, and secondary complications that might occur during the trauma care or rehabilitation phases of care. We'll also explain how you might prevent secondary complications. A CT scan or MRI of the spine may show the location and extent of the damage. Spinal x-rays may show fracture or damage to the bones of the spine. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, uses a strong magnetic field and radio waves to produce computer-generated images. This test is extremely helpful for looking at the spinal cord and identifying herniated discs, swelling, bruising, or other masses that may be compressing the spinal cord. Computerized tomography, or CT scan, may provide a better look at abnormalities first seen on an x-ray. This scan uses computers to form a series of cross-sectional images that can define bone, disc, or other problems. Your doctor may decide to do a myelogram if other tests are inconclusive. Myelography uses injected dye to help the doctor see spinal nerves more clearly. After the special dye is injected into the spinal canal, x-rays and CT scans of the vertebrae can reveal herniated discs or other problems. It's important to remember two major factors that can improve the patient's chance to attain the most function possible and avoid complications along the way. One, it is essential the patient receive immediate trauma care following their injury. Two, once the patient has been stabilized, timely transfer to a specialized spinal cord injury rehabilitation facility can aid greatly in the recovery process. After a spinal cord injury and initial tests, there is much work to be done to minimize and prevent progression of the injury, including stabilization of the patient's medical status, reduction and restoration of spinal alignment, decompression of nerves, and stabilization of the fractures. Surgery may be necessary at the trauma care center or a nearby hospital. Your loved one may need it to remove fluid or tissue that presses on the spinal column or to remove bone fragments disc fragments, or hematomas. Surgery helps stabilize fractured vertebrae by fusing the bones with special hardware. Your loved one may wear some type of brace after surgery. Following cervical spinal stabilization, a halo device or cervical collar may be needed. After thoracic or lumbar stabilization procedures, a Jewett brace like this, or a TLSO, which stands for thoracolumbosacral orthosis, may be worn. While the initial injury or disease stabilizes, doctors also focus their attention on secondary problems that can come up. These include nerve pain, changes in muscle tone, contractures, pressure ulcers, bowel and bladder complications, blood pressure problems, bone density loss, respiratory infections, and blood clots. Nerve pain, also called neuropathic or central pain, can occur after a spinal cord injury especially in someone with an incomplete injury. Normal treatments include medications and therapy. It is important to treat pain with analgesics, muscle relaxants, and other therapies specific to spinal cord injury protocols. When your loved one is first injured, the body's muscles become limp. This is known as flaccidity. As reflexes are recovered, your loved one may experience the opposite, spasticity. Spasticity can be reduced by many oral medications, medications injected into the spinal canal, or injections of Botox into the muscles. Pressure ulcers are skin sores that can happen on any part of the body, with bony areas being particularly at risk. Pressure ulcers can be caused by constant pressure from lying or sitting in one spot, friction, moisture, temperature, or poor nutrition. Because a patient may not sense deep pressure, pain, or light touch, this may also lead to skin breakdown. Pressure ulcers can be prevented or greatly minimized by medical professionals shifting your loved one's weight on a regular basis. You can learn how to help turn him or her while in bed or to relieve pressure on the sitting surfaces 
when he or she is sitting up. Make sure your loved one's skin is being checked at least twice a day and that splints are being used instead of casts to make regular checking easier. Point out any skin changes you notice to the care team for immediate treatment. Autonomic dysreflexia is a potentially life-threatening condition that can occur in some patients, particularly in people with complete tetraplegia. Symptoms for autonomic dysreflexia include a painful headache due to sudden increase in blood pressure, slowed heart rate, increased or abnormal sweating, red blotches on the skin, and restlessness. Autonomic dysreflexia can lead to stroke, seizures, or even death if not dealt with quickly. You can help prevent it by watching for causes such as an overfull bladder, impacted stool, infected pressure ulcers, or even ingrown toenails. Spinal cord injuries can have secondary health issues in addition to their direct medical and physical impact. The person's limited mobility after their injury or illness may lead to a more sedentary lifestyle placing them at high risk of obesity, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. It is vitally important to follow the advice of the care team regarding a consistent routine of diet and exercise to keep your loved one as healthy as possible for both the short and long term. We're now ready to explain the specific levels of injury and their possible impact. Typically, there are three main types of spinal cord levels of injury, high cervical, affecting the highest portion of the spinal cord, low cervical, and thoracic. Your loved one may have a lumbar or sacral injury at the lower end of the spinal cord. This video provides detail about the cervical and thoracic levels of injury. Please select the subsection of Chapter 5 that applies to your own or your loved one's level of injury.